Good morning and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Top Web Webinar Series. If you have any questions during this presentation, please type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar menu and we will answer them at the end of the presentations. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, June 1st uh, edition of, of Crop Talk. Uh, the uh, spring season is going by fairly fast, and uh, with the wet conditions, we've uh, been uh, looking and waiting to get back out into the field. So I thought today would be a good opportunity to maybe do a little bit of a crop update. And then there's been a, quite a few questions coming in uh, regarding the crops for the crop scouting panel and uh, I guess a lot of the questions are going to be dealing with wet conditions but uh, you know I think there's also a few other things happening so I think we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll go from there but uh, to start with a little bit of a I guess a, an update of what's been happening out, out in the field and uh, a fitting uh, map to go up uh, right at the start uh, showing the uh, amount of precipitation uh, in the past 30 days and uh, I guess no surprise to everybody in Manitoba here that uh, we're well over the uh, uh, high we're in the high percentages of, uh, of average uh, you know with the dark blue being over 200 percent of average and uh, you know basically I think most of the province is uh, 150 to, to 200 percent of average so uh, um, and uh, it seems like a, a never-ending story. We just keep getting the Colorado lows coming in and uh, and dumping more rain on us. So where are we seeding right now? Um, this is a tough one to do this year because uh, there are pockets where uh, they haven't been getting as much rain, so the, some of those areas are a little bit higher. And then there's pockets that have been getting lots of rain. So some of those areas are maybe a little bit lower, but for an average uh, right now for the province, we're sitting at about 40% complete, uh, which is well below our five-year average and definitely will, uh, be, and behind our what we were last year at this time. And, uh, you know, just uh, talking a bit about those pockets and where people have gotten more crop in and where people are going to be waiting longer now after the recent rains. Yeah, you know, you look at areas that are kind of west of number 10 highway. We missed uh, the, um, the recent rains. We were kind of on the western edge of those. And you don't have to go very far east of number 10 where the, the rainfall numbers start to increase quite a bit. And, and as we go farther east, even, even higher. And uh, when we're, we get talking to uh, producers in those areas, uh, they're talking two or three days uh, before they'll be back in the field. And then when you start, you're talking to producers west of uh, kind of number 10, where we didn't get the most recent rains, uh, producers are probably gonna be going today um, still wet. So it's not like it's uh, dried up where you can go anywhere. I think producers are still having to uh to pick fields and um and leaving areas um <clears throat> i know in a lot of areas um uh floaters are being used a fair bit right now to, to try to get uh, canola in the ground and uh so there's uh definitely a lot of things happening to uh, to try to get the crop in so what i thought would be a good idea would be uh, maybe to go through uh, some of our reporting areas areas and uh, talk a little bit about what's happening. So I was uh, able to get some input from uh, from the guys I worked with uh, yesterday and the day before uh, regarding what's happening in their area. And I kind of put uh, a, few, a few slides together, just a breakdown of, uh, of the areas and what's happening. So if we start, uh, I'm just gonna call it north of the park. Uh, uh, you know, you go all the way you know, up to the Paw and uh, the Paw's actually had a, you know, uh, a pretty reasonable uh, spring so far. They're about 50 percent, uh, maybe even a little bit higher done in, in the area. Uh, most of the, the spring wheat and canola is uh, is is going in pretty uh, pretty regular. Uh, there are pockets again up there that have been getting some high amounts of rainfall. You look at Ethelbert, 
uh, where they're uh, reporting up to 325% of normal. So again, that would be a pocket that's probably fairly far behind getting crop in. Uh, Robin Swan Valley area, uh, approximately 40% complete, uh, and it's a mix of crops. And that goes back to producers picking fields that are able to travel on and able to get planting. Uh, one thing that is pretty common this year is uh, uh, changing varieties and not just starting with wheat, getting all your wheat in and going to canola and getting all your canola in. You got producers that are going back and forth uh, from uh, different different crops and different varieties. Uh, you get into that Dauphin St. Rose area. Uh, they are, fair, are, are fairly far behind right now. Uh, most of the seeding in that area only begun last week uh, uh, due to the spring moisture they've been getting. Um, and uh, some uh, crop that was planted uh, on before the major rain and may uh, have emerged in those areas. So we're going to definitely have, and I think that's another common theme uh, throughout the provinces. We're going to have crop that's emerged already and we're going to have crop that's going to be planted. So our growing season is definitely going to be lengthened this year and uh, jobs needed to be done out in the fields are going to be uh, quite variable from uh, weed control to uh, to uh, disease or spraying for disease because with these wet conditions we could definitely be looking at some disease issues this year. So that kind of gives a little bit of, a, of what's happening to the northern side. Um, you look in the southwest area and uh, you know after the most recent rains producers got back into the field last week uh, but the rain that uh, we uh, the, that this area received was uh, Friday night and basically all day Saturday and uh, a lot of the areas reporting uh, at minimum of uh, an inch throughout the whole region and there was areas that uh, received even higher amounts uh, there was a stretch right along number 16 highway uh, on both sides that uh, probably on average received two inches. Uh, a lot of those uh, areas uh, are looking at maybe getting back uh, seeding uh, today. I think uh, we'll see a lot of uh, equipment in the field today. Some guys were, were uh, doing some stuff yesterday trying to dry fields out. I think that's a common theme as well this year. Uh, harrows, uh, pro-tills, uh, cultivators, anything guys can get out there and, and try to dry some of the land out uh, is being done. For, uh, for this, this region or for the southwest, uh, probably about 30% complete. And again, it's going to vary. When you go to the, <clears throat> the western uh, side of the uh, region uh, in that uh, Miniota, Miniota to Macaulay area, uh, Reston area, those areas uh, got maybe a little bit more, more crop in. But then again, as you kind of go work your way east and north, uh, that's where uh, a lot of the area is is lower, uh, you know, anywhere from that 10 to 15 to 20 percent, depending on where you are. Uh, and uh, some of that land is a, a little bit heavier, and because of that, it's just taken a little bit uh, longer to dry out and uh, uh, being able for producers to get back out on the land. Uh, some of the areas uh, that uh, were a little bit drier and a little bit uh, lighter land when you get into that uh, uh, area, kind of in the Fox Warren area, uh, south of Russell area, uh, early seeded crops are, are up and you can row the fields pretty good, uh, uh, looking like, you know, in that two leaf stage already and, and coming up fairly well. So with the moisture we have and heat we have, uh, those crops are definitely going to, uh, to take off fairly fast. When you look into the area, kind of in the south, uh, I guess eastern part of the of the province, uh, uh, again, uh, there uh, uh, the recent rains, uh, and you're going to basically put everybody yeah. at a standstill for seeding right now. Uh, some pretty high amounts in some of those areas over the last couple of days, and uh, but uh, before the rains hit, uh, there are some of the smaller operations. Uh, we're getting close to 80% done or 80% of the seed in the ground. Larger operations were in the, anywhere from that 40 to 50% seeded. Um, talking to uh, Earl, a lot of the uh, uh, grain corn that was going to be planted or that's in the ground now is, is basically what's going to be planted. A lot of those acres are going to be switched over now probably to 
uh, you know, canola or cereal crop, depending on uh, when they can get back out on the land. This area and uh, and Terry uh, area is going to definitely take a little bit longer to dry out. So these guys are probably going to need two or three uh, good drying days before the guys will be back out on the field. Uh, if some corn does go in, uh, they're looking at maybe some silage acres going in. And like I mentioned, acres will shift from uh, to canola uh, that were planned for corn, uh, soybeans, uh, and lots of soybeans and canola to go yet. So I think uh, you know a lot of those ones. If the land uh, dries up fast enough here, we'll, we'll see that happen yet. And uh, if uh, it, it gets delayed anymore, we're going to see uh, a lot of that uh, be seeded uh, to uh, cereal or uh, or uh, some type of feed grain. So. Uh, um, Again, uh, you know, uh, we need the, the, the dry weather to, to kind of to get on board here because uh, those areas are fairly wet and we're running uh, running against the, uh, the clock here as uh, we're looking at the 1st of June right now. <clears throat> so if you go into the kind of the north uh, eastern side of the province and again they got, uh, you know, anywhere from 20 to 75 uh, millimeters of rain uh, and uh, most areas reporting 50 millimeters so you know again uh, kind of a heavy rainfalls that weren't required in that heavy heavy clay soil uh, you know you get two inches there that makes for uh, water standing in fields uh, water uh, standing uh, crops that were planted and that were coming up are now in, in underwater so we're going to need some uh, nice drying days to uh, to get uh, get those crops uh, dried out as well as to get back on the land. Um, when you look at planting in that area, uh, you're looking at cereals about 65% complete, and that's mainly wheat and oats. Uh, um, very little barley planted as of yet. Um, canola about 15%. Uh, soybeans 70%, and they had a pretty good run there uh, just uh, before the rain, so they were able to get a, a fairly uh, good good uh, portion of the soybeans in. Again, uh, another crop that producers are, uh, we're going to need things to dry out for guys to uh, uh, to get back out in the field. But uh, if you're looking at about an average for them, it would be about uh, that area, about 60% complete. And as I mentioned, uh, early seeded crops are uh, are starting to uh, starting to uh, to emerge right now, and uh, and this is uh, I guess uh, going to make for uh, as I mentioned before, a fairly long uh, drawn out growing season this year. And uh, basically uh, the sprayer is not gonna be put away till late fall. So that's a brief outline of, uh, of what is uh, kind of happening in the, in the area, uh, uh, in the province. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, uh, amounts uh, of rainfall this time seem to be uh, stayed more to the eastern side of the province and because of that they're, they're going to be a, uh, a couple days before they get back out uh, the western side and as I mentioned guys will be going uh, again today if they hadn't started uh, yesterday afternoon. So with that uh, I'm going to hit into the crop scouting panel and uh, we're going to go through a few of the questions that have been coming in and uh, the first one I've got is for, uh, for John Hurd. Um, I had a producer uh, asking me this question, uh, actually it was last week he started asking and was asking this and then saying it's starting to get late. It's uh, hard to travel on the fields with a lot of weight and looking at pulling the fertilizer, the nitrogen right out of the out of the tank and not put any on nitrogen on right now. Uh, but then they're also looking at uh, how much time do they have before they need to apply this nitrogen. and uh, he was looking at it for mainly his cereal crops and and for his uh, for his uh, canola crop is what he was targeting uh, pulling uh, pulling the nitrogen out. So uh, John, uh, you have some comments yeah. to make there? Okay, good good question. And one of the great things about uh, nitrogen and its flexibility and why uh, farmers do have so many options uh, because nitrogen we can apply it later and because it's mobile. I, it'll move into the soil, uh, unlike the other, like like uh, uh, phosphorus and potassium. So uh, shrewd move to remove it uh, from the the seeder if it allows them uh, to get the seeding done. And uh, 
you you know we've had studies with this before uh, and it kind of depends on how much you're able to get on at seeding if you can get a good portion of the nitrogen on at seeding studies here where they've put on 50 to 25 or sorry 50 to two-thirds of the nitrogen on at seeding that opens the window until uh, stem elongation or uh, flag leaf emergence. So in your picture there, that would be uh, to stage six to stage nine. That's how late you could go. But if you don't have much nitrogen on there and you're only dependent on the nitrogen that's in the, the MAP or the phosphate, then you want to squeeze that up earlier. You want to get uh, uh, the bulk of what you want to supply the crop on earlier. And uh, I would say uh, let soil dictate, let soil will be your guide in doing that. Uh, as far as putting it on broadcast urea or, or dribble 28. And again, uh, if it stops raining uh, and we're putting this on a moist surface, if there's no rain in the forecast, uh, and, and, and we have windy, warm conditions, that's where it uh, would be benefit to be using a urease inhibitor. With canola, again, uh, same kind of rule, the, 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 the less nitrogen you have on early, the more important it is to, to uh, uh, get your application out there early. Uh, if you're dribbling 28%, it can cause some pretty visible scorch of the leaves. So I like, I'd like to get it on earlier, but you can go as late as the start of bolting to get that on. Okay, um, and what about, uh, he was wondering, um, is there any value in uh, phosphate and potash on afterwards as well? Uh, yes, long after, when the price uh, drops. <laughs> okay, yeah. so he, yeah, yeah. There, 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 there's no use peeing away phosphorus on the surface right now when it's so expensive. The only reason you put it on is for uh, maintaining removal amounts and uh, this crop isn't going to see much of that so uh, save it for uh, a more reasonable cost and when you can put it in the right place okay and uh, because the surface of the soil is so wet right now um, some type of inhibitor would be almost uh, essential, I guess. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, just because right now the only way we're losing moisture is by evaporation. And if we lay like urea on the surface, it will dissolve very quickly. And uh, that uh, ammonia portion of it can uh, drift off uh, as, as that soil wet uh, dries out. In fact, we'll have losses until uh, uh, that soil surface is bone dry, then the losses cease, or until we get uh, another uh, quarter to four tenths of an inch of rain. You know, you, you do the metric conversions, Lionel, I don't, a quarter inch to four tenths of an inch is what we need to put urea or UAN into the soil. Okay, and if he has uh, enough nitrogen, he feels to get them up to say the flag leaf stage. What kind of rates would you be thinking of when he gets to that stage that he would still see? Well, it, 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 he needs to have about two thirds of it on up front to get to that stage. Otherwise okay. you're just starving the plant too long. So I, I don't think that's the situation we're talking about. And in fact, uh, that's the tail end of the window. I would not be wanting to wait that long Hopefully the soil dries out well before then. I'd be shooting at stem elongation at the, the uh, I'd want to have it on before stem elongation or at stem elongation. Great. Okay, thank you, John. Okay, good luck. Uh, next question, I guess will be for Ann Kirk. Uh, with the later seeding time and decisions needing to be made on crop that would be on crops, what would be a better choice of cereals to seed at this time and still maximizing yield and quality? So I guess what type of cereal would be our best to look at right now, Ann? Yeah, that was a, a bit of a tough question. Um, 
I looking into research or other information, I didn't find any like, you know, really specific clear answers or comparisons on wheat, barley and oats seeded wheat. But looking at our mass data, um, looking at individual risk areas um, and how uh, yield of those very of those three crops when planted in the second week of June, I did see that in general wheat was able to maintain yield the best uh, compared to barley and oats. So in terms of relative yield, wheat most of the time retained the most yield. Um, and then oat oh, and then um, oats was kind of medium and barley was the worst, like barley wasn't able to maintain yield. And that does make sense because uh, we do see that of the small grain crops, like the spring cereals are very um, preferred development under cool temperatures. So um, it's just important to remember that any heat stress during, during vegetative stages or uh, reproductive stages can cause yield loss. So, uh, so we do know that Wheat is the most heat tolerant with oats and barley being more sensitive to warm temperatures. So I think wheat is the is a better choice when planting late, just because it will be able to better tolerate uh, those warm temperatures during crop development. So we do know that some of those yield components, such as you know number of tillers, number of spikes and spikelets per spike, and then also how successful pollination is, um, can be uh, impacted if those things are happening during warm conditions. Uh, but we do also know that small grains like wheat, barley, and oats do have a good ability to compensate among other yield components. So, for example, we know that the number of spikelets per spike is determined during the four to five leaf stage, so very early on in development. So, if we do see warm temperatures even above 18 degrees Celsius during that time, uh, we can see, you know, less spikelets per spike. But if we have better conditions during another developmental phase, um, those crops do have ability to compensate for that as well. So that's my long-winded answer of saying I think that wheat is a better choice at this time of year. Yeah, that's uh, a good point, and uh, it always seems like uh, the heat is the one that seems to to affect uh, the barley and oats the most. And uh, but I, th I guess this year maybe we'll have the moisture, which will help it out a little bit on that end. Yeah, definitely. We like obviously the the biggest concern is having drought and heat conditions at the same time. This causes you know obviously a ton of stress on those crops so yeah but we just have i think it's important to remember that even heat during those early stages like the four to five leaf stage is impacting yield as well so um so yeah we'll just hope for some good conditions during crop development early on so that uh, you know that it's not too hot hopefully we don't have a june that's too hot so that um, these crops can get off to a good start um, another question I got yesterday, and um, not really a lot to do with uh, with this one, but it's uh, how high of a seeding rate would you go to reduce the amount of tillers? Um, I guess, uh, like for spring wheat, for example, people are probably going to, you know, he was, low he was yeah, he was like, go thinking, you know, should I be looking at three bushels an acre? Oh, yeah, I guess um, I, I like that it's probably not, not that, like three bushels per acre, I think would be fairly reasonable. I'm just thinking in plants per square feet. So, you know, in general, we don't really see a lot of yield um, benefits planting above, say, 27 plants per square foot. But I do know people like going into the low 30s, so maybe 30 to 33 plants per square foot as a target seeding rate seems reasonable if you're looking to decrease the number of tillers. And we also know that um, like when seeding later, yeah, later on, you might want to increase seeding rate to decrease the number of tillers so that we have you know more even maturity and quicker maturity. And we also know that um, higher seeding rates can be more beneficial in a low yield situation. So low yield for any number of reasons, whether it's um, you know, fertility issues or, you know, soil issues or also just environmental conditions. So when we're planting late, we do have um, lower yield potential in general just because of the, the calendar date. Um, so increasing seeding rate makes sense for both of those reasons that we should we should be pushing in a bit at this um, later seeding date as well. Okay, good. Thanks, Anne. Um, Next question, and I think uh, a 
a lot of people are getting this question as we're getting later and later, and this would go to, to Dane. Um, what are some of the common mistakes you see with people that are uh, looking at broadcasting CD canola? And uh, the one that came in yesterday was what about seeding by air? Because uh, there's uh, some planes starting to look at flying on some canola. So uh, I guess, uh, Dane, if you want to take that, start with that one, and then I can ask you the second part uh, when you finish that. Lionel, I don't see Dane on. Oh, okay. I will uh, come back to this question then maybe in a couple of minutes here. Uh, question for John Gavoski. Um, with the weather we've been having, whether it be the rains or the, the winds like we had yesterday, uh, what effects uh, does he think it'll have on Diamondback, uh, uh, Bertha Armyworm, and uh, now that we've got some canola in the ground and there might even be the odd field where it's starting to come up already, uh, flea beetles. Uh, I know I've seen a lot of volunteer canola growing and I haven't uh, seen any flea beetles in my travels yet, but uh, any comments you wanna make on, on these three guys, John? Sure. Uh, I'll start with diamondback moth. So diamondback moth, it doesn't overwinter very well in the prairies. It, it gets blown in on the winds, and we have had some very significant winds from the south. So far, the only, I won't call them high populations, maybe moderate populations that we've seen have been in the eastern part of the province. Uh, with the trap network we've got out, we've got uh, just a few traps in the eastern region that are around 20 moths cumulative so far, which isn't really alarming. It means that uh, at least a small population has got blown into the eastern region. So far, all the traps in the western region are barely showing anything. The odd trap will have one or two moths and that's about it. So currently, um, it would be more the eastern region where we just wanna keep an eye on things as the canola is coming up. Now, the other side to this, when those moths do arrive, they will be more productive if we have nice, warm, calm evenings for them to fly and lay eggs. We really haven't had good egg laying weather for them as well. So even though some have started to show up in the traps in the east, it remains to be seen how abundant they will become. For the army worm, I, it is going along pretty much uh, close to its normal rate. Uh, we do monitor something called growing degree days. Uh, this is an insect that overwinters here as a pupa. It's a bit slower in its development this year because of the growing degree days, but we think probably by about mid-June they should be starting to emerge. And I'm going to speculate at this point that they will be uh, very little affected by what's happened so far, except for the fact that there could be some later development. Pupa stage is a bit more uh, resilient to the excess moisture than, say, um, the, the larval stage would be. We did not have big populations last year, so I don't know that there is a lot of pupa in the ground. But what is there, aside from being delayed a bit, um, I'm not going to speculate that they would be in affected in any way. Uh, flea beetles. The one thing, if there is a silver lining to what's been happening, when the canola does come up, uh, hopefully it is germinating quickly and moving through those seedling stages quickly. Uh, it, it will be seeded, seeded into warmer soil this year and soil with good moisture, if not too much. Uh, but the big thing with flea beetles is getting the plant from the data seeding to the three to four leaf stage in three to four weeks. If you can do that successfully, often you're not needing to foliar spray. And we may have a better chance of actually doing that this year, given that the fo people have been forced to seed a bit later. Uh, sometimes later seeding can help reduce the flea beetle damage. It has other consequences, such as increasing risk of heat blasting later on. But uh, there, again, there could be this silver lining where the, the seed treatments actually do hold up and get the plant to that three to four leaf stage this year. That's a good point. I think canola is definitely gonna 
come up faster and uh, and if anything i know it's it's, it's all being so unfairly shallow so uh, again another reason for it to come up faster so hopefully uh, uh, you know we can get by it that way i seen something on twitter yesterday and uh, uh, i probably shouldn't read that too much stuff into that but somebody put on there thank god for all this moisture it'll control our grasshoppers uh, i think you've made comments about that before but maybe if you just want to give your opinion on that one too okay um yes moisture can control grasshoppers but the timing part to it is really critical um so there's lots of different species of grasshoppers uh any grasshoppers that have been out so far are not the pest species they're species that overwinter as nips and they're not the pest ones the pest species all overwinter as eggs in a normal year with normal temperatures the eggs would be just starting to hatch right about now um this year things have been delayed a little bit i think within the next week people may start seeing some of the hatch happening but regardless the egg stage is really resilient to excess moisture um and i, I always give this example because it demonstrates the point so well a colleague of mine took a bunch of grasshopper eggs one year and put them in a glass of water and let it sit for a week on his lab bench dump the water out and the eggs all hatched. So water sitting in ditches and fields in April and May likely isn't doing much to reduce the, the hatch of the grasshoppers. It may slow them down a bit because they're in a cooler environment. So hatch might be a bit later, but uh, grasshopper eggs can remain submerged in water for days and not be killed. Once those eggs hatch, those young nymphs, they are very vulnerable to excess moisture. So not that we want more rain, but if we had had the same conditions that we got a few days ago, say a week from now, uh, or two weeks from now, even better, that would potentially make a bit of a dent in the grasshopper population. But I would still be scouting for grasshoppers just as intently as last year. I'm not convinced that the weather we've had so far would do anything other than maybe slow their emergence. Okay, so one of the things I see too is a lot of the uh, pasture and uh, a lot of the ditches having water in them. Uh, so if they haven't hatched yet and they're underwater right now, will they just stay in that state until the water? is gone or will they eventually something happen to that egg? Yeah, that's a good question. And a, a lot of the, the conditions for the hatch, uh, temperature is a biggie. Uh, the water might be keeping the temperature where the eggs are cool enough that it, it, it basically keeps them in that um, uh, a, a, a stage where they're really not developing until things dry out a bit, heat up a bit, and then they will hatch out. There may be some hatch that actually occurs while the field is still uh, somewhat flooded. That could happen, but my speculation is that things will, because of the cool conditions created by that water, things will be remaining um, as they are basically as far as stage of development goes until a lot of that water drains and things heat up a little bit. Great, okay, thanks John. Uh, next question will go to uh, Dennis Lang. Uh, will increasing my seeding rate uh, make my or help in making my beans mature faster? Um, hi there. Yes. So we'll we'll divide this up into two categories, I guess. First of all, um, we'll look at uh, we'll look at soybeans uh, first of all. And with soybeans, typically, you're if you're in a solid seeded situation, you're typically planting. 200,000 seeds and ideally you want to be between 140 and 160,000 plants emerge. That's kind of what your target is. Um, soybeans are daylight sensitive. So once you get that trigger, um, it does in, in summertime, it does start, they do start to flower. So really the, increasing your population isn't really going to gain you anything as far as maturity because they tend to, you know, mature very similar based on the weather conditions. Um, dry beans is a question that I got asked here on Twitter here the other day, and there were a few people that uh, chimed in on the on the responses. Um, personally, I've never seen a stand. Uh, you might gain maybe a day or two on dry beans um, when it comes to maturity if you have a heavier population. 
but really is not the way to really be looking at it. I would tend to switch to an earlier maturing variety first. Um, and uh, But one comment I would like to make though, is that you wanna make sure you have a good stand in either one, uh, either soybeans or dry beans. If you're thinking that you know, you're just gonna cut your seeding rate back, um, then what can happen is your stand is thinner. And I have seen you know, crops hang on longer because the stand is too thin. So you just have to maintain your stands, um, your, your target stands that you're shooting for to start with. And if your germination is a little lower, let's say on your dry beans, in that situation, you might want to increase it just to make sure you, you hit your, your uh, ideal stand. Good, thanks Dennis. Uh, I'm gonna go back to uh, the question for uh, Dane. I think he's back, he's with us now. and. Uh, and uh, we were talking a bit about broadcast seeding and a fair bit of it going on. And uh, I was asking Dane what uh, you know think producers should be watching for when they do look at broadcast seeding. And then I did mention that uh, I had one producer uh, tell me yesterday that they were looking at booking an airplane to seed some canola as well. So Dane, if you want to maybe uh, take a stab at that uh, first part, and then I'll ask you the second part uh, right after. Thanks, Lionel. Um, good question. Broadcast seeded canola. Uh, it's certainly something that growers have on top of their minds right now as seeding is really delayed and there's not a lot in the ground. A couple pros and cons about that. I mean, certainly you can cover a lot of acres very quickly, but you're not going to get the same uniform seed distribution that you would with a ground rig. And your broadcast distribution really varies by broadcast method whether you're metering out canola seed as a single commodity by a Valmar or a small air spreader, or it's in, in a, its own separate tank with a floater unit versus incorporating seed with fertilizer and blending them together and bulking up the seed in order to be uh, broadcast via a floater that might only have a single tank method of air boom distribution, or then running it through a spin spreader. Last, don't recommend running it through a spin spreader at all. Certainly use an air boom or some sort of boom that uh, allows better distribution across the field. Because canola seed pellet size is much different, especially if you're blending it with a fertilizer product, the different densities and the different sizes of those pellets um, will impact the distance that they're spread across the field and how evenly they're distributed, especially if you're going in a high wind uh, kind of day. We know that uh, if you're going to be broadcasting canola, uh, target a broadcast seeding rate of a pound or two above your normal seeding rate to account for lower survivability and lower germination. So you want a minimum of 10 seeds per square foot, which is what we normally do with our drilled methods. Um, so push that number up closer to 12 to 15 seeds per square foot just to get that surviving uh, five to seven to have, to have that ideal plant stand. Once broadcasted, um, a shallow tillage pass is an absolute necessity. Uh, if you're looking to have that crop insured, you need to have that crop incorporated by a shallow tillage or a harrow pass. Your seeding date is only considered to be the date that you do that tillage pass, not the date you actually float on or, or um, use an airplane to broadcast canola seed. So you need that tillage pass and recommend only doing that tillage pass once. If you do it more than once, uh, there's the likelihood that you're going to be bringing up more canola seed than you actually buried or bringing up what you buried on the first pass so single pass is all you need however if at all possible make sure you've got rid of lumps you've got rid of excess matting of residue uh, those sorts of things you need a seed bed in, in pretty decent condition in order to be able to get the canola seed into the soil and to contact the soil to have that seed stratified and, and tied up on residue mats or, or hairpinning on the surface isn't going to do you any favors either um, if you're considering broadcasting, we're using a floater, uh, consider using at least the minimum amount of required phosphate fertilizer. Uh, canola needs access to ermic phosphate. However, as we move later into the season, phosphate does become more available just due to warmer soils, et cetera. So it's not, it doesn't become as critical, certainly, but it certainly does help. <clears throat> and then given the delays we're facing this year, check with your retailers or your broadcast uh, applicators and get on the books as soon as possible. They have a lot of work lined up for them this year. And uh, you want to make sure you 
you come priority on that list. Did you have specific questions about seeding by air, Lionel? Um, I don't know if it was, uh, I guess uh, when I got the question yesterday, I just remembered back uh, when we did have uh, the really wet year and guys were doing it and the problem that they were seeing or you were, I think you made the comment regarding uh, soil contact and I think the, the problem with seeding by air is well, you definitely can't travel on the field. So what guys were seeing was uh, just sitting on soil uh, residue or crop residue instead of uh, in the soil. So I think uh, that was uh, probably my biggest concern when I was talking to that producer was that, uh, you know, they're going to definitely need to be able to get out there and and uh, and do some type of incorporation to uh, get that uh, soil to seed contact. That's That's absolutely correct. I mean, Broadcasting by air can be done. We know there are aerial applicators that will do it, but do know that is the wild west of, of seeding a crop. I mean, getting it in with a traditional drilling method is certainly best. Floating would be, you know, your second best option. I would stay well away from the airplanes as long as you possibly can. Do recognize that it is only June 1st. Canola is insurable to full coverage level uh, between June 15th and June 20th, depending on what risk area or what region of the province you're in. So that is still three weeks. Um, and we can still see fairly sizable and substantial yields with canola. It's not as sensitive to a late seeding date as, say, some of our cereal or corn crops. So definitely do try and get on the field. Do try and prep wherever you can. Recognize that it might take a little longer than you would like. Um, obviously, focus on your higher priority crops, crops that are more sensitive. Your soybeans, your cereals right now knowing that canola does have a little bit of time in order to establish and then to making sure that you incorporate to to allow yourself um, that crop insurance coverage and then making sure that crop fully establishes those are the two key parameters to having crop insurance coverage on broadcast canola uh, okay just a couple questions or uh, one comment uh, what about rolling after incorporating uh, the comment is that it helps uh, in uh, can help germination in canola as well. Uh, there's very little research on the topic, but practical experience would say that you know if if you incorporated it and it was a very fluffy or a very light seed bed or there was a lot of residue in there, rolling on it as long as you know it works with the soil conditions, that should help increase seed to soil contact by. Um, of squeezing a little bit of the air out of those topsoil spaces and, and improving that seed to soil contact. However, we do have very moist soil, so I don't expect germination to be much of a problem, um, but do know that rolling on afterwards can increase bulk density, you can increase your compaction, and it may be harder for canola to root down later if all of a sudden it does turn dry and we do have a, a fairly compacted layer. So be cautious with that one. It can work, um, but it can also backfire. Okay, good comments. Uh... And while we're on uh, broadcast seeding, the um, uh, question was, does anyone have any experience with broadcast uh, and incorporating wheat? Um, any comments, Dane or Anne, or if you have any comments regarding on that? Uh, I have nothing to add there. Yeah, I don't have, I've, I've heard that people who are considering it or a few people have done it but i don't have any comments or advice for broadcast um seeding wheat yeah it's something that uh i haven't i haven't seen uh seen so uh um it would be uh again i think uh getting that seed soil contact would be huge and i think with wheat it might be even harder trying to get a, a evening distrib distribution of the seed as well so but uh but yeah, no, I, I haven't seen it myself. Um, yeah, I think just with the larger seeded crop, um, it, it would be trickier than canola. So I, I just would caution people not to expect the same results as they would with canola. Right, good point, yeah. Uh, Dane, the question I got was regarding uh, volunteer canola. And uh, I tried to get the, the picture onto producer sent it to me on my phone and I couldn't somehow get it downloaded onto my computer but uh, actually the stand of canola looked looked fairly nice uh, uh, mm -hmm. 
I don't have good experience with volunteer canola, but uh, any comments on volunteer canola? I think you made a good one to me right off the start. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not a recommended practice in part because the producer doing it would be, would be in violation of their technology use agreement if they're using any kind of herbicide tolerant genetically modified canola at all. So first off, if you are considering doing that, absolutely first step is to talk to your seed rep or, or your your yeah your life science company representative that would cover that uh, particular canola hybrid that is a volunteer from last year. Um, I do know from some conversations with uh, seed reps that we do see yield losses right off the top. I mean, take 20% right off the table right away because you're moving on to that F2 generation. You are segregating out from true hybrid canola and you're going to be getting a wild variety of off types. You will start losing um, the genetic resistance or the genetic traits that are built into that hybrid. So you'll start losing uh, pod shadow resistance, if that's the case. You'll start increasing your disease risk since your black leg or your club root genetics uh, will not transfer fully into that F2 generation. So that is also a problem. Um, if you are able to get an exemption from your TUA and keep that volunteer, um, that volunteer seed crop, know that it should be treated like a swath crop, not whatever pod shadow resistance or anything like that. Certainly treated like a traditional canola crop in that way. Uh, and you're gonna have to manage a plant stand. I mean, having a fairly thick volunteer canola stand in spring looks good, but it might actually be too thick. So you may see plants lodge or have weaker stems, that sort of thing. So do know that that could be a downfall um, or it could be too thin, which is more often the case where we see scattered pockets where it's thick in one area and, and absolutely nothing in another, um, set your expectations lower to begin with. But first part of that conversation is absolutely talking to your seed representative and making sure you're not in violation of your technology use agreement or getting an exemption to do so, which I believe has been done in the past, but it's in a very limited case-by-case -case basis. Hey, good comments. And uh, uh, I agree with you with the volunteer. You always uh, seem to see uh, um, a thicker stand kind of right behind the combine and then as you go farther out it thins out so depending on where you're looking in the field you could have some uh, quite uh, quite a variability in your stand that's for sure that's right uh, okay uh, another question that has come in and, and uh, uh, has anybody seen uh, after the recent uh, heavy rains uh, uh, last week and and What's happening to the soil surface? Is it crusting, or are we? Uh, was the rain uh, general enough or slow enough that it didn't cause any crusting? I know on the western side here, I would say that that's probably something we don't need to worry about. Uh, any comments, uh, Dane or Dennis, in your areas as to what you guys are seeing? Well, I'll jump uh, in. Right Dennis here. here. Go ahead, Dennis. Oh yeah, no, in this area here, um, you know, we're still dealing with the, uh, um, just with the excess moisture here. So at this point here, I think things should be okay once it starts drying up. Um, the rain was hard at times, but you know, there's, I don't think I'm going to worry too much about it. I think more growers are just concerned about what they can actually still get in yet. So. Yeah, good point. And I think one of the issues that usually happens, uh, uh, right after those rains to cause a lot of the crusting is is a lot of heat and uh and we uh we haven't really got those warm hot days yet so i think uh, i think the wind yesterday probably dried things out enough that we probably won't see a whole bunch of crusting but uh yeah i think the biggest thing right now is uh getting a lot of the moisture gone in some of those places okay uh next question Question for Kim Brown. Uh, yesterday or a day before yesterday, I was out in some fields and I was uh, seeing this weed and uh, for life of me, I couldn't think of what it was. Uh, so I sent a picture to Kim and she answered me right away. So Kim, uh, you wanna maybe talk about this one and maybe uh, some of the other wet weeds that we're seeing more of right now? 
Uh, yeah, thanks, Lionel. Uh, that to me just looks like plantain and an easy way to check with plantain is you pull one of those leaves away from the bottom, like just pull a leaf out, like you're pulling a stalk of rhubarb off and actually break, like snap the stem and pull it apart. And there's little strings um, in there that, 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 that attach it. They're in the leaves too, but really if you break that stem, you get these little strings that hang out. Um, plantain generally is not a really bad field weed but it is an indicator that we are very wet um, plantain is a weed that you'll find in the wet corners of the field you'll find it in the wet spots in your yard and so we are going to see these weeds this year uh, we have wet weeds we have dry weeds um, and we're going to start to see things like this that show up when it's wet i expect we'll be seeing things like landsleaf sage and um Oh, some other things like uh, speedwell, um, purslane speedwell, and that type of thing. And um, we'll see some of those. And we, depending how it goes with seeding, um, some of our other weeds that had been showing up in the dry conditions, we may not see as many. Like we are definitely seeing the kochia starting. There's a lot of seed bank out there. But kochia does well in saline soils. And when other crops don't grow well because the soils are dry, if the salinity is increasing, we do see more kochia. So we definitely have the kochia out there. But if we do get a crop in and that crop does well because we've had the moisture, that moisture is washing those salts down, um, we won't see that, we shouldn't see that kochia creep and get, you know, pushing into the fields and getting more and more and more of it. We should see uh, that decrease a little bit, but there is a lot of kochia seed out there. And so the, and right now there's nothing to compete with it. Uh, so that seed is growing. So that would be, you know, we'll hopefully see a few weeds like that, like that, and then foxtail barley. Uh, again, those sh could be on the decrease, but that depends on us getting a crop in there to use up that moisture. If we don't get those areas seeded, and that moisture ends up you know evaporating off the surface those salts come right back up again and so i'm hoping that we you know we are able to get the crops in and to those areas and get those um get those weeds kind of getting those uh pushed back a bit so again there's not a lot you're going to do about these wet weeds right now other than try to grow a good crop and get a good competitive crop in I would caution you though, we are starting to see some real growth on things like lamb's quarters. That's always a bad one. I've seen it a couple inches high and with six leaves already. That is really getting beyond the good staging for spraying. You've got to get that one when it's small. So if you are able to get seeded, please get out there and do some type of a burn off either right ahead, probably that's not possible, but right after the seeder, um, as quickly as you can, the crops are gonna come up quickly um, and you know you don't want to get caught where you're waiting for a burn off and then the crops up and you can't get a burn off because some of these weeds out there are already really big. Uh, if you're into low disturbance seeding, you're not going to be doing much uh, damage to them when you're seeding. Um, you're not going to take many of them out if if you know if you're in there with uh, with with any kind of low disturbance seeder. So they're going to be ahead of the crop and some of them are already getting really big. The, there's some wild buckwheat out there that's getting very large as well. That's always hard to get. And uh, like I said, when the weeds are ahead of the crop, uh, that's when they cause the most yield, yield losses. They take nutrients, they compete for sunlight. Uh, this year, we're not worried about them competing for moisture, but you know, other than that, they, are, um, they can really be a problem when, when we see this happening. Okay, uh, thanks, Kim. Um, comment from John Hurd, he said, Curl Dock is a regular flooded soil mm -hmm. indicated weed in the valley. Yep, we'll see curl dock and honestly sometimes when you start you'll actually see things like bulrushes and uh, cattails and things like that will show up in fields that you've never seen them before. Um, there's tons of seed around the seed bank and the soil. There are millions and millions of weed seeds in our soil. Um, and if there isn't a crop growing the minute there's enough moisture to germinate them and there's no competition, something is going to grow. Um, and if there's no crop there, it's going to be a weed. So those are just things to watch out for. Okay, and uh, Dane uh, also uh, shared a link with me that we'll send out with the recorded uh, webinar, and it's uh, a link on broadcast canola seeding, and uh, so uh, we'll send that out to everybody. Uh, Kim, while you're talking, do you want to maybe talk a little bit about this event that's happening tomorrow? Uh, yes, yes. And um, so this is Weed Seedling Identification Day. We are partnering with ACC and Brandon. This is at the North Hill campus. So um, the old mental hospital, if you guys remember, anybody who grew up in the Brandon area remembers it was called that. 
um, remembers when it when it was that hospital. And so that is their North their North Hill campus. And so uh, if I sorry, I should have shared a link with you. I do have a map. If you are attending the Weed Seedling ID Day, it starts at 930. We're going to have a presentation first where I will go through um, different ways, different weeds and how to identify them and, and different things like that. Um, kind of we've always done Weed Seedling ID Day like that. And then after that, we're going to go to their weed garden, which is in the greenhouses, which is kind of on the opposite end of the campus. So if anybody does like, um, I can share uh, the, the link with the map. Um, and and so the parking is kind of on the on the north end of the campus and then you have to walk down to the one building so it does start at 9 30 but we are asking everybody to arrive fairly early because it is a bit of a walk from where you can park to the building that you actually that we are having the presentation in and then from there we'll go back over to the greenhouses and actually look at weeds they have a really good weed garden going uh, where they've got some weeds started and uh, so there's some perennials and there's lots of annuals also and we're bringing a, a few what we can from Carmen this has not been great weather for digging up weeds to bring because it's sopping wet out there we have a few but um it's been difficult so uh, but we do think we have a good selection and it's a good idea to you know to get some of that weed training there are cca credits available as well and um and so two pest management CEU credits are available for it. So that's great for anybody that has a CCA. So again, if anybody wants to just text me and I can send them the map, or I think Danielle on their website, the ACC website has the map up as well. But I do encourage you to arrive a bit early to make sure you get there in time for the 9.30 start. Okay, good. Uh, that's gonna be a good day. I've uh, attended a few of those in the past and uh, they're always uh, really good information and good part about it is there's people there that could help you uh, uh, pick out things to look for when you're trying to identify a weed. Uh, sometimes there's uh, key things that uh, you look for and it eliminates a lot of the other weeds. So good day to attend. Thanks. Something else that's going to be happening this year and uh, Marla is on today and I was hoping she could maybe give us a little uh, update on, with uh, crop diagnostic skills. You bet, Lionel. So thanks for um, pop popping this slide in. Uh, so we are back uh, to an in-person crop diagnostic school. Uh, we are doing one week. It is July 5th to 8th. Um, and as you see on the slide, 8.30 to 3 o'clock daily. So 8.30 start, we'll have people start kind of rolling in for registration at 8, likely. Um, but uh, what I will do is I will give Lori the... Um, uh, the link for registration. We're using Eventbrite to register. And so if anybody is interested, she can post that or send that out with the link to this recording. So again, we're looking forward to having an in-person school. And uh, uh, yeah, if anybody's interested in coming, please sign up and sign up early because things will start filling up pretty quickly is my guess. Yeah, because uh, I think we used to have it for two weeks, right? And uh, one yeah. week, I think it will fill up fast. Yeah, so we've actually increased our numbers per day ever so slightly to kind of make up for that a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a little bit different this year. We're trying to make a few changes, but it's been two years of an online hiatus basically with uh, Crop Diagnostic School. So we're definitely looking back forward to having those blue and white tents back up. Great. Thanks, Marla. Okay. Hey, um... If uh, people are wanting to get a hold of Kim for tomorrow's uh, uh, Weed ID Day, there's her contact information. So uh, just check it out on that this slide. Uh, also, the field crop production guides are available at all the service centers. And or if you're wanting large orders, again, you can contact Kim. Um, uh, Marla, is there a farmer price for a diagnostic school? At this time, we do not have a farmer price for diagnostic school. It is something that I've been wanting to uh, talk to our team about, uh, just considering the year as it is, because I know that I think in 2019 we did that. We've done that not consistently year to year, um, but hang on for that information and I will um, send that out too. If anybody follows uh, at Crop Chatter is the uh, the Crop Diagnostic School webpage uh, or tw Twitter page, sorry, we will be tweeting that out as well. So again, I can make sure that um, Lionel gets that information so he can send it out to uh, this mailing list um, to make sure that people are aware if a uh, farmer price or a, a code is made available in the next little bit. 
Okay, good. Yeah, and if something does happen, we'll uh, have it on the on Crop Talk as well. So uh, uh, there's the uh, contact information for uh, uh, the uh, ag adaptation specialists in uh, in the area and uh, had their general areas uh, earlier on in the presentation. Our livestock uh, specialists for the province. Again, you know, if you're I think a lot of people are getting cattle load on pasture right now, so hopefully we'll uh, be able to, with this rain, have great pastures and they can stay out there till November and uh, and we can maybe get some feed up this year. There's the Ag Service Centers and their phone numbers if uh, you need to get a hold of any of them, especially as we're approaching seeding deadlines and if you want to question where you are, are uh, uh, what is your deadlines and you want some quick information that would be the people to contact and that's it for today there's uh, mine and Lori's uh, contact information uh, join us next week it'll be June the 8th and hopefully I'll be saying we're 75 to 80 percent seated by that time uh, let's keep our fingers crossed thanks for attending and see you next week